This is the Digital Music Trends coverage of Medium 2014, an interview with Scott Cohen, founder and VP of International at The Orchard. DMT's coverage is brought to you by CI, the platform that helps the record labels deliver their content to over 250 digital services on ci-info.com. So hi Scott, and it's great to have you here at Medium. How's it going? Um, it's going amazing, but it's a bit overwhelming. Yeah. You know, <laughs> Medium is full on. Yeah, it's the first day and I'm already getting spa like moments where I'm slightly spaced out, but it, it's, 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 it's very good, uh, actually. Great, great meetings this, uh, this morning already, so uh, yes. can't complain, really. <laughs> no, no, no complaint. No, exactly. You know, if, if, it's, if you have to take a lot of meetings and you do it in the south of France, and then you complain, then there's something wrong with you. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I wanted to start by talking about, uh, you know, the, the Orchard as a spring point of our conversation, essentially. Uh, you know, a, a company that was started back in uh, 1997. And so my, my first, quest, first question, I guess, it's, it's a difficult question, but it's just asking as, as a, one of the few companies that from 1997 to today has managed to thrive, sort of uh, how, how have you succeeded while so many other companies have failed in this space? <laughs> Um, I th how have we succeeded? I mean, again, that is a complex question to answer, but I think one of the things is we've kind of baked into the DNA of the company that change is fundamental. Yeah. That I think a lot of companies over the past two decades, particularly in the media space, keep getting caught because they think they know what it is. So it was the traditional music companies, for instance, that didn't want to transition to digital downloads. Um, but then you see companies that came up in the early 2000s, and then they started to say, now we understand the business, but it changed again. It changed in the mid 2000s with, you know, uh, you know 2005 plus with uh, the social media, you know, MySpace then and Facebook and Twitter and, and then you come into the streaming, you know, ad supported services and subscription services like Deezer, Spotify, RDO, now Beats, throw YouTube on top of it. And it's, it's an ever changing space. And we're, that's what we're used to. That's what we're expecting. We're expecting that whatever we do today will not be the same as what we do next year. Because early on in the company as well, you had a, there were like some big issues when it came to like physical distribution. The, the, you had some troubles with your like your stocking house as well. And so it's one of those yeah. one of those points where you know the company could have gone either way, right? Oh yeah, no. In in the very early days, because we never took any financing back in the '90s, it was an incredibly challenging landscape. And yeah, there were moments where we just didn't know how we were going to survive, um, but we did, and uh, ultimately we we we've now thrived. Um, in this space. Um, and so it's, it's not just understanding that the business is always changing, but also trying to look forward and anticipate where it's going to go. And even I would say, not just anticipate, but, but try and shape what that future is going to look like. Not just hoping we guess it right, but actually to build out those elements that people don't even know that they will be needing, but, yeah. but they will later. And, and the company, as a, you know, as a, in your international role, I mean, that's hugely important because the company has really thrived in, in its international standing as well. You have offices all over the world. So uh, how do you manage uh, the expansion of a company uh, that is so rapid, but at the same time it has to be controlled so that, you know, costs and everything else doesn't spiral out of control? Well, again, I think, I think that's, you know, the challenges of, of a big company. And, and it, it kind of goes on two levels. One is you need to build in process and systems and infrastructure so that you can manage all that. And that there's a huge cost to that, but what happens is it frees you up. Yeah. And at the same time, the complete other end of the spectrum is do whatever needs to be done locally. Right. That, that each market is different. And so you can't put a square peg into a round hole. So as long as you have this foundation for capturing information, dealing with people, re reporting. But then you have to say, but what is it exactly those people need on the ground? Because they're going to need something different in different markets. And our job as a, as a distributor is how do we create value for our clients? And our clients are record companies and, and filmmakers and artists and um, how do we create value? And it's different. It's different company to company based on their size, their catalog, and it's different 
based on their 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 location. So our challenge is build a rigid structure underneath it that we have process and then very I wouldn't say loose on top, but reactive to flexible. the local flexible. That's the right word at the top. Yeah, sure. Uh, so you know the, the orchard are one of the, the really interesting parts of the business that's developed over the last few years is your MCN, uh, uh, you know, uh, multi-channel network that you developed uh, over over a number of years. The company, of course, has, has taken its first steps in in the video side of things. I think it was uh, circa 2008, 2009. You started like looking at monetization of, of of YouTube videos. And so, how did the evolution of that into a multi-channel network come about? Was it deliberate, or did you just? end up with a multi-channel network thanks to you know the various channels that, that, that you developed and then when the concept came into being of a multi-channel network you essentially were already there as, as a company well it, it it didn't start in 2008 it right. we actually had our first video department in 1999 wow. um, and it was run by a gentleman uh, called Ron Jarrett at the time and and he's still in film and we were just incredibly too early if I th if, if we were too early in music and you know in the mid 90s way too early for online video so we we tried it for a few years and then kind of parked it on the side we waited for you know uh, devices bandwidth and consumers to be ready to relaunch in a meaningful way and when we did that it was always of the intention of you know as a distributor, we get lots of different types of content right. and from lots of different types of content providers. So some's music, some's television, films, uh, action, sports, videos. We, we and, and, and some are combined, um, you know, music with film. It didn't matter. We just knew that we wanted to provide those services in that space. And because of that, we've built up one of the largest multi-channel networks in the world and always coming in top 10 with YouTube. And I think last year we finished as number seven globally in YouTube partnerships. That's amazing. And uh, so looking at how you integrate also uh, partners that are non-music related, you know, how, do, how did that uh, piece of the puzzle develop? Uh, is, it, is there a completely different department that deals with that? Um, yes, we, we, we have different departments for those. And, and, and some of it is around um, what's considered traditional YouTube stuff, but then we, we have, you know, our film departments that are dealing with, you know, Netflix and, you know, iTunes and Muzu and, and Love Film and all the places where people are consuming film. Yeah. Um, then there's the hybrid stuff, which is a lot of sports. You know, I love the concept of even action sports, which in the scheme of things was not something that could have been monetized you know when we thought of sport we thought of competitions what you know what's your who came in first second or right. third and now we think of action sports and we drop somebody well not we somebody gets dropped on the top of a, a mountain with a helicopter and and straps on a snowboard and goes down and there's no winners or losers um people just watch action sports yeah. um so it's an entirely new category with a new type of audience. Yeah. Um, and it's been tremendously rewarding. Um, it turns out people love that. And, and it works on both platforms. It works on the, the YouTube style platforms, but it also works in the movie style platform. So it's, and it's always um, uh, powered with music underneath it, so it, it powers that. So it's a it's an incredible category. Yeah, and video is interesting because I, 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 I'm, at least from what I see from my experience of Netflix, uh, it's still a very uh, you know distilled service. So it's not like an iTunes or you know or even a Spotify where you have you know millions of cover versions and all sorts of stuff in right. there. They only have certain movies uh, on the service. So do you think that these kind of services are going to start opening up to more independent content? Because I'd love to see more independent movies on there. And I'm sure the filmmakers want to get the movies on there. It's just a question of whether they come through the filter or not. Yeah, the, 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 the issue now is that there's, there is actually very limited supply in, in film compared to music. I mean, it is, it, where, where it's highly curated and goes through filters. Um, Yes, it's going to open up. I mean, it just will. 
um, you know, platforms uh, for music, you know, when iTunes Store launched, had, you know, in the low millions of songs, and now they have 30 million. It, it's not that in the last, you know, eight years, we, 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 we generated 28 million new songs. It was that it just took a while to, to, to populate. Yeah. And talking about uh, distribution of, uh, of video content as well, uh, are you seeing more uh, full length uh, uh, features, uh, whether music related or not, uh, appear on channels like YouTube? Because even because you know they might not be able to find distribution on on, on larger, uh, more established streaming platforms, but on demand streaming platforms. Yeah, well, actually, what we're seeing with the long form is a, is is a bit of windowing. So, right. starting in the you know, paid downloads into the subscription and ending up finally on the the ad supported models. But what I find most interesting is content being created for today's generation, which is not the long form, which is the short form and the micro content, which right. I find the most interesting now, because if you're on a, a device and you have somebody sends you a video, you know, I'm not gonna watch a, a 90 minute film, but I might watch a piece, a short movie on my iPad. Maybe I'm waiting to catch a plane or going to the office. So I really want 10 and 20 minute worth of content I don't need an hour or two hours yeah. and then being on my mobile maybe I just want 30 seconds or a minute some micro content and I think as people get more and more creative around that I think that's going to be a massive um, opportunity for filmmakers yeah and, and looking at uh, the music side as an MCN and uh, you know you're a propon big proponent of micro content uh, you know I've, I've heard you speak before on this and it's uh, absolutely fascinating as a subject uh, as an MCN, then, of course, you're looking to monetize the content that is put out there by artists and creators. So of course, if you have a 30 second or even like a 10 second commercial before a 20 second video, that, that kills the experience, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, the, the, the advertising, if, if you're putting advertising against it, needs to be proportional. But, but really what we're looking at to drive revenue is instead of looking at the length of the film or the number of views, or the advertising. What what really interests us today is looking at the number of subscribers per channel. Right. And that is a much more relevant way of, of examining it. And in that sense, what is a subscriber worth per year? So if you have a YouTube channel, what's a subscriber worth? Um, you know, how much content do you need to put up on your channel to then realize the maximum amount and so now we're looking at how many subscribers per channel and on average how many minutes per session per week they spend on that channel and that's a, a, a different way to evaluate how much you can earn and ultimately so then what is a subscriber worth um i don't know if i should go on record and throw out some a number <laughs> don't worry about it i won't i could but i won't <laughs> and so uh if we're looking at, you know, but let's just try and compare platform now. Like uh, if we're looking at the value of a subscriber on YouTube compared to the value of a fan on Facebook, for example, are you, I, uh, you know, what, I, what I'm understanding here is that there is actually a lot more value in a subscriber on YouTube than in a fan on Facebook, when it, especially when it comes to visibility of, of, of the content, right? Yeah, I mean, there are different platforms and they have different languages and different value propositions. With that said, um, if I have an artist on Facebook that has a large following and does a status update and gets a lot of activity, um, a lot of likes, shares, and comments. Facebook doesn't pay me anything for that. Yeah. YouTube would. Every time somebody watches my video, I get paid. Every time somebody likes my status update or my tweet, I get nothing. So it doesn't mean that platforms are worth nothing. They're valuable. They're good partners. Yeah. They're part of an ecosystem. However, they don't pay. And, and more importantly, you pay them. And often, if I do a status update, 85% of my audience never sees it anyway. Um, so I think there needs to be a little bit of adjustment in terms of how some of these social networks operate. Um, again, they're, they're incredibly valuable. I use them, we're partners with them. There's nothing negative, but I think it's time for a little balancing and adjustment because 
if it was me, I would drive my, my audience to a place that I monetize the activity. Yeah. Not, not just merely message to an audience and hope that I can monetize them in another place. Sure. Of course. And uh, when a label or, a, or a, an artist comes to you, uh, do you find that they're still, you know, do you have to give them a lot of, a lot of, a lot of direction when it comes to um, actually monetizing <coughs> YouTube properly? Because there's several different revenue streams, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> YouTube is massive. I mean, they are a beast and it is complex. And a lot of people think that they can just deal with it themselves. Um, it's, 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 but it, it's kind of like um, that guy, Donald Rumsfeld, who used to work, who used to be the Secretary of Defense under George Bush. Right. Just so you know, I'm not a fan. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a very left-wing liberal. And he said something once in, in, in some congressional hearings that actually, to me, made the most sense of anything he ever said, yet he got the most uh, criticism for what he was saying. And that was when he was talking about the, the, the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. <laughs> and he was talking about the invasion of, of, of Iraq and and. In this case, it's there's things in the world that you just uh, are known unknowns. So in their case, they were like, we know they have chemical weapons. We just don't know where they are. So you know something. So people know there's this opportunity at, at, at YouTube, you know, labels. So it's a, it's a known unknown. They're not exactly sure what they're supposed to do, but they think they can handle it themselves. The biggest thing is the unknown unknowns. Right things that they're they're only even aware to ask the right questions of what's possible and it's and, and it's not just youtube i would actually say this is across the entire digital space a lot of labels you know they, they feel confident or a lot of content owners like i know my content which they do and then they go therefore i can just deal directly with everyone and do it myself which is okay but it's the unknown unknowns that they don't know what they're missing. They have no concept of how all the opportunities are missing because they don't know those opportunities exist. And, and some of it to me is so basic, the, the, the SEO, the optimization of, of, of all your content. Um, you know, asking questions like, how do I get my content to surface in a service like Spotify? Right. So Spotify, there's no, there's no, you know, main page placement. So if I have a catalog in there, how do I get users to play it? Um, and if you don't even know what questions to ask and how that works, then you'll just get checks from them and either be happy with what you get or complain, but you, you're missing a whole nother opportunity. Yeah, that's for sure. And the you know, finally, to, to talk about video beyond YouTube, uh, I'm, I'm doing a panel tomorrow on video. And uh, so that was one of the questions that I was kind of mulling about whether is it even worth asking that, you know, is there life for video beyond YouTube for artists and, and what might that life be? Um, what, what, the answer is yes. I mean, w once YouTube has taken over the world and has 100 percent market share, then people will begin to chip away at it. You know, that's just the way of the world, you know, there was a time when everyone was on, you know, Microsoft and had their, their PCs and, you know, you know, little by little you get chipped away at. So that'll happen. It, and it's not a, anything against YouTube. They will continue to grow through that period. It's just that there'll be other platforms. Um, yeah, there'll be other platforms. There'll be other um, companies that will enter this space as ways of exploding video content. I mean, there already are some, but Right now, YouTube dominates, dominates, dominates the space. Yeah, exactly, because you know, uh, platforms like Vimeo, for example, don't offer don't offer monetization, so that's that's a big problem, right? Right. It, it's more than just monetization, but yeah, that's part of it. And you know, right now, everyone is on YouTube, so to ask them to go somewhere else is 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 a challenge. So it, it'll it'll happen. Um, and it'll happen with niches breaking off, categories breaking off, you know, that, that, that's where you'll see it. Yeah. You know, it, or you, you know, even look at how Vivo's done it in an interesting way, where, where in conjunction with, with, with YouTube, essentially, um, 
they create a platform that says, if you're on Vivo, it's only music videos. So it's never user generated content. We love a dog on a skateboard, but we're not, you're not going to see it on our channel. And creating that and by doing that, they become by far the biggest MCN in the world. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was looking at the stats from the next Big Sound report uh, of, of last year, and uh, I think all of the videos that were, all the artists were from Vivo, that were in the top uh, 10, I guess, of next Big Sound, had reached over a billion views, whilst artists were just on YouTube. Uh, only Sai had gone over a billion, and all the other artists were under that. So that kind of shows the power of, of that platform. Yeah, and, and, you know, and those views are also more valuable financially. Yeah that you make more money per view on Vivo. So that's a compelling reason why now you see all those artists pushing their, their, their content over to Vivo. Absolutely. Well, Scott, you know, it's, uh, it's always a pleasure talking to you, and uh, I, could, I could sit here for an hour, I'm sure, uh, talking about random stuff with you, but... Uh, two, two, uh, digital me two digital media geeks. <laughs> 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 but I'm sure we'll have many more chats on the show uh, in the future. Well, uh, yeah, I'm going to leave you at that, because I'm sure you have lots of meetings to get to. Uh, but, uh, of course, go and check out uh, The Orchard, uh, and uh, I'm sure if you, if you Google uh, Scott, uh, you're going to find the other videos of uh, him uh, uh, from other conferences and stuff online as well. So. Never Never as good as this one. Maybe Never as good as this. Ones from the past. <laughs> That's great. Well, thank you so much for your thank time. You. And thanks so much for listening to the DMT coverage uh, of uh, Medium 2014. You can find everything on digitalmusictrends.com or youtube.com slash digitalmusictrends. <laughs>